Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Opioids kill more people each year than car accidents. Indiana University is putting $50 million towards an effort to combat addiction. Indiana University's grand challenge is going to go such a long way to help turn the tide against this crisis of addiction. And it is going to give more hope to the far too many hopeless. Ahead, a look at the goals of the initiative and how the university plans to achieve them. We travel to a rural Indiana community where tourism is almost as valuable to the local economy as agriculture. But it really is an international draw and it really is amazing to go through the list of people who sign up to see where they have come from, but certainly all 50 states. A visit to Park County as organizers prepare for the Covered Bridge Festival and millions of visitors. And why are dental students taking jewelry making classes? These stories and the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Well, we have so much to get to this week. We're going to start with headlines and we go straight to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Senator Joe Donnelly is adding to his campaign cash advantage over the Republicans seeking to oust him. Donnelly reported $1.3 million in donations during the last quarter. Representative Luke Messer and State Representative Mike Braun reported significantly less. Representative Todd Rokita didn't release numbers but did indicate his campaign contributions are down. The Republicans say some of their donors aren't in a giving mood out of frustration with Congress's inability to pass legislation. And Donnelly was in Brownsburg yesterday touring a drug treatment facility and participating in a roundtable discussion about the opioid <laughs> crisis. I am a addiction. I've met folks from um, almost every community who are struggling with this. And our job is to give them hope, to tell them we can beat this, to let them know that there's assistance available and that there's purpose and dignity and, uh, and opportunity. Donnelly recently co-authored legislation aimed at increasing the number of people trained to work in treatment facilities. The legislation allows people who commit to a mental health counseling career for at least two years to get up to $50,000 off their student loans. U.S. Senator Todd Young says veterans too often face delays given getting services. Young met with federal Veterans Administration officials yesterday in Indianapolis to discuss the long waits many veterans face to have claims processed. He says the average wait time is around two years. Young says the problems stem from personnel issues and outdated management processes. There's new legislation in place to help these government employees better serve our veterans. That legislation will finally be implemented early next year. Young says he personally has gotten involved in a couple of cases to get them processed. He spoke specifically about one case where a veteran had been waiting almost 10 years on an appeal. State officials are debating how to spend Indiana's nearly $41 million share of a Volkswagen court settlement. Volkswagen is paying billions in fines for violating the federal Clean Air Act. Indiana's share is supposed to go toward offsetting the effects of diesel emissions. The governor appointed a committee this week to work out what specific projects the money will support. 
The Vigo County School Board approved a budget this week that includes some money for maintenance. As we've reported, the schools are overdue for renovations. The $150 million budget includes $18 million for capital projects. The capital money will pay for maintaining facilities and fixing or replacing equipment. The board is considering whether to pursue a $2 million bond request next year to help fund larger capital improvements. A judge will consider granting a change of venue for Daniel Messel's trial for an alleged sexual assault in Bloomington. The hearing is set for January. The case is unrelated to Messel's murder conviction of IU student Hannah Wilson. Messel faces attempted rape and other charges for allegedly attacking the woman in 2012 after offering her a ride home. Authorities say a DNA analysis linked Messel to samples taken from beneath the woman's fingernails. Sigma Nu Fraternity is suspending its Indiana University's chapter due to violations related to hazing and alcohol. Fraternity members have until October 22nd to move out of the house. This is the fifth IU Greek organization to face disciplinary action over the past two years. Bartholomew County is increasing its income income tax so the jail can hire more personnel. The council approved the half percent income tax hike this week. The sheriff says he'll use the money to add four or five new deputies. According to authorities, inmates have attacked officers several times over the past two months because of the high tensions in the overcrowded jail. Unfortunately, we have inmates in a, in a, in a confined area, more inmates and uh, you know, when you have that many people in a, in a, in a smaller uh, area, uh, you're going to have more issues. More than 100 beds in the old section of the jail are sitting empty because there aren't enough officers to staff the area. Well, just a little more than two years after becoming a city, Fishers is seeing explosive growth. The opening of Swedish furniture maker IKEA this week means more economic development is expected. The excitement for the Fisher's IKEA prompted many people to camp out for days ahead of this week's grand opening. We actually showed up on Sunday night at probably about 10 or 10.30. Construction resulted in 500 jobs and the store will employ more than 300 Hoosiers. But the economic impact doesn't end there. There are fewer than 50 IKEA stores in the United States, so Fisher's will be a regional shopping destination. They don't think about having a store on the north or the south side of Indianapolis they're intending that store to probably service a ring of maybe a radius of 100 miles in a circle. That means more retailers and restaurants are likely to open in the area, and it's part of a growing trend for the Hamilton County community. Fishers transitioned from a town to a city in 2015 and elected its first mayor, which led to major changes. There are now people in Indy who drive to Fishers to work, and what's being created is not just a place to come home at five o'clock to. It's a place you wanna be 24 seven. According to US Census data, the city's population has grown by more than 13,000 residents since 2010. The Trump administration's new rules on birth control open the door for some employers to stop covering contraceptives as part of their health plans, including the University of Notre Dame. Notre Dame student Kate Roche is part of a lawsuit challenging those changes. She says she's worried about her access to birth control if the university stops covering it for employees and students. While I respect their religious ideology, I think that there's a point at which when students are unable to access basic, basic health care because of their university's religion, there's an issue with private rights. Notre Dame's president is applauding the move to stop covering contraceptives, saying in a statement it reinforces religious freedom. And Joe, the university is still working with its lawyers to determine if and when they will stop that coverage. All right, thank you very much, Barbara. Indiana University says it plans to attack the opioid crisis on all fronts, and it's putting $50 million behind the effort. As Lindsay Wright reports, the initiative is one of the largest collaborations in the country that's aimed at fighting the opioid epidemic. IU President Michael McRobbie made the announcement at the State House alongside Governor Eric Holcomb. Then a video played. I still can't believe that they would make choices that like they did that night. This can happen to anybody. No families are untouchable. 
The video shared Becky Savage's story. She lost not one, but two of her sons after they experimented with opioids during a night of partying. McRobbie says the stories of loss are becoming all too familiar. It affects IU faculty, staff, students, alumni, and their family, friends, and neighbors. People are dying, and we must act. That's why IU is pledging $50 million, rolled out over five years, to tackle the state's opioid epidemic. Through the multifaceted research project, IU is working with the state and health operations like IU and Eskenazi Health to collect and analyze data, address the clinical work shortage, create better policy, and more. IU's efforts to respond to the addiction crisis will be aligned in this way with state and federal government efforts and will include collaboration with the Indiana congressional delegation, local communities, industry, NGOs, patient groups, and many others. Holcomb says combating the opioid crisis and expanding treatment are top priorities for his administration. He also positioned the state's first ever drug czar. But he admitted, until last year, he didn't realize the scope of the problem. When Hoosiers started sharing with me their most personal stories, it seemed like everywhere that I went, it quickly became apparent for me too that this crisis affects everyone. Holcomb says IU's initiative in collaboration with state efforts will save lives. And team leaders on the project say perhaps the most vital partner is the public. It's not just the scientists, it's not just the teachers. We need to partner with our community to understand their experience and the interventions and the support that they need in partnership with us to help address this addictions crisis. Now this is the third grand challenge project the university has awarded. The previous projects announced were a precision health initiative and environmental change research. Lindsay Wright is here now. Lindsay, addiction, like those topics, cover a huge area. How are these partners going to be able to measure the success? Well, they recognize right out of the gate they're not going to be able to stop addiction, but the goal is to reduce the number of deaths. So in 2015, 1,200 people in Indiana died from opioid overdose. Um, so IU has detailed five areas which the initiative looks to improve. That includes education, collecting data, collecting research, working with legislators to create better policies, and engaging with the community. So those are broad areas, um, but the money will also go to hiring 10 new faculty at IU, along with research and science positions. Um, but that's about as specific as IU President Michael McRobbie got. So now, how does the state get involved in this project? So it's, it's not clear how the state will be what role they will be playing. But Governor Holcomb admitted that he wasn't really sure of the scope of the problem, but now he realizes it's widespread. Um, so, so there are a lot of partners involved in this, uh, this project. It's not clear what they will be doing, but it's very clear that it has I, Holcomb's complete support. And really quick timeline for this issue. $50 million rolled out over five years, but in terms of you know, when they want to reach specific goals, there's no real timeline that's been laid out. Okay, thank you very much, Lindsay. You're welcome. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Fall's the best time to visit Southern Indiana. Coming up, we'll take you to two areas of the state where autumn is a powerful economic driver. And imagine paying to get locked in a room and then having to find a way to get out. Escape rooms, they're a growing form of, inter of entertainment across the country. We'll go inside one. Coming up right here on Indiana News Desk. of explorers. We seek new ways of living, of thinking, and of expressing ourselves. We take risks, we learn from experience, and we keep moving forward. That's why we encourage and celebrate 
the explorer in all of us. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Well, as fall kicks into full swing, so does tourism around the state. Small towns come alive with out-of-town visitors. My colleague Miranda Fulmore joins us now with more. Thanks, Jill. AAA reports that across the country, travel is up. In the fall, a family road trip is the most popular vacation, and increasingly it's because of fall festivals and seasonal events, something there's no shortage of in Indiana. Tucked in between cornfields and hidden down one-lane dirt roads, the cover bridges are what sets Park County apart from other rural areas of the state. The reason we have so many bridges, geographic is right for them, but also the financial situation of a poor county like this really demanded that they keep what they have and make the best use of them. It's a quiet adventure today, hunting for the 31 bridges that dot the countryside. But you could call it the calm before the storm. Two million people, that's a half million more than attend the Indianapolis 500, will flood into the area over the next 10 days for the largest covered bridge festival in the country. And most people are really proud of their county. They're proud that we're able to pull this off and do this kind of a thing. And you have 10 days in October that you can just show off what you have and where you live and, and what people like to see. Farming is the main economic driver here, but right behind it, tourism. And so what this festival does for us the estimate is about $15 million are, are left in Park County after the Covered Bridge Festival in the hands of people who buy things. Aside from the bridges, one of the most highly trafficked spots during the festival is Mike Rose Mill. It looks like an image you might see on a postcard. People come here for the flour, ice cream, and purple grits. Rowe depends on the profit he makes during the festival to sustain his family for the whole year. It's, it's unbelievable. There's no way my wife and I could do this without that festival. Uh, like I said, Millard had to give me half the money to buy the darn place. The foot traffic from Rose Mill feeds into the antique shops and ice cream parlors that sit idle for the other 50 weeks of the year. In addition to brick and mortar businesses, it's estimated that more than 700 vendors come out to sell homemade goods and crafts. Some locals even rent their property. People renting out their front yard, their barns and stuff, uh, and it's just a sea of white canopies, you know, everywhere. And uh, over here, now there's a 90-acre field over there, and the farmer's daughter started out with like a 15-acre parking lot. Then it's 20, then it's 25. I think she's up to about 30 now. Then another guy over here, he just tripled his. And all together, we probably have, I'd say, 120, 130 acres of parking. On the weekend, we run out of room. Out of the 31 covered bridges in the county, all but five are open to regular traffic. Most of the bridges date back to the 1800s, and the county works hard to maintain them. The state helps some. The county gets about $1,200 per bridge each year for preservation. But Mee says that leaves a lot of burden to the county, and some residents question whether they're worth maintaining. It's always tough to sustain or even to justify sustaining things like this, uh, the covered bridges certainly, unless you understand and realize how economically significant it is to the people who live there. Um, Park County would really be suffering, I think, if we didn't have that $15 million of new money ingested in our economy every year. And if we didn't have these bridges, you wouldn't have that festival. So I think people realize it's all tied together. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Miranda Fulmore. A AAA survey found that more than a quarter of people who are traveling this fall are centering their trip around going to see the changing foliage. Now in Indiana, you'd be hard pressed to find a better spot than Brown County. As Sophia Salaby reports, the changing leaves are a regional tourism draw. Brown County is definitely one of the top rated places to come in the country for mountain biking. Um, over the years, uh, HMBA, the Hoosier Mountain Bike Association, has done a great job building trails out here. and trying to turn it into a mecca for the Midwest mountain biking scene. Eric Harris has been coming to Brown County for close to 15 years to mountain bike. Harris says he knows when it's fall, not just because of the changing leaves, but also the increase in tourists. It's pretty early in the season, but I definitely, you can definitely see a difference in the traffic. Uh, there's a lot more people in town, but the leaves are just now starting to change, so it should just get busier and busier over the next couple months. Some worry that the possibility of a bad foliage season could hurt tourism. However, Brown County native Ashley Dayton says the lack of colorful leaves won't affect business at her store. With a lot of people, it's tradition. They come to Brown County, you know, 
in the fall season. So it doesn't really, I don't feel that it affects it that much because no matter what, even if they're not the very best, they're still beautiful. It's still a beautiful town and it still looks great. So I don't think it may, may, matters that much. Stephanie Kritzer is also a resident of Brown County. She says some residents have mixed emotions about the amount of tourism. Well, as far as those of us who live here, it, it gets kind of crazy. We replan our our routes to town uh, because there's so much traffic and visitors. But with the increase in traffic comes an economic advantage. We're uh, seeing some new shops open, which is good for the whole community and uh, so people are getting employed at least for a little while. According to a study done in 2013, visitors to Brown County spent over $34 million. That spending supported 642 jobs. Jenny Sue Wettstein is the manager at Miller's Ice Cream House. She says the fall, especially October, is her most profitable time of the year. It is the busiest month. I would say we do approximately 20 percent of our business for the entire year that one month. Like many smaller counties around Indiana, Brown County allows people a chance to escape and take a break from the hustle of bigger cities. Charlie Starling and his family are from Indianapolis. He says the quiet atmosphere and pumpkin patches of Brown County appeal to everyone in his family. This is a lot of fun. It's a fun place for us to come and get away and feel like we're kind of transported out of the city life for a weekend. Uh, take us back to a little bit more relaxing place over here. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sophia Salaby. County officials begin promoting the season in early September. There's even an online leaf cam that allows people to view a live panorama of Brown County State Park. A popular activity that's trending across the country is finding its way to Indiana. You get locked in a room with friends and maybe even some strangers and have one hour to get out. I visited the newest escape room in Bloomington to see why it's catching on. You know what, come in and I'll show you how we can get out. If you've never been, think puzzles, theater, teamwork, and brain power. The more puzzles you solve, the quicker you open doors and find your way out of the room. There's a storyline that goes along with the room too. You are a secret agent, but you're captured, so you start off in handcuffs right here. A game master listens and watches your every move, so if you get stuck, you can ask for help. This is our control room. This is kind of where the magic happens. We can't show you too much of the room or we'd give away the puzzles. Players have 60 minutes to escape, but you can't tell who's having more fun, the players or owners. Especially if you end and you're on one step away from the game and the timer buzzes out on you and you're like, oh man, what do, what do we have to do? So it's more, what's the word, addicting? I, I actually, they're addicting to me and I build them. Locked Up plans to expand to Mishawaka, Fort Wayne and Indianapolis. Other local game puzzlers say the escape room market hasn't hit its ceiling. Enigma Puzzle House is Bloomington's first escape room. Owner Scott Smith calls their business the mom and pop model. They build and pay for it as they go. Here, you're dealing with the real world. It's a real space, which means that you can, people can climb on tables, people can flip things upside down, they can it's, they can interact with your game in ways that you didn't predict. File this one under unresolved. They plan to open their third room by the end of the month. Smith says the most difficult part of the business is creating the rooms themselves. But that's what makes every escape room different. We'll always have a crowd of people coming in because they know that there's going to be something different each time, something weird, um, something uh, unique. Um, and so we are only limited in that sense by our imaginations, which are pretty weird, I have to say. Good luck. You love the circus acts from the fearsome strong man. Handcrafting jewelry takes precision, attention to detail, and dexterity, exactly the kind of skills needed by a dentist. Some dental students are using a jewelry-making class to hone the skills they'll use in their future careers. Yeah, dental were the majority of my students when I first started here. And they made amazing work because they didn't really know what to expect of themselves. They didn't feel like they were very creative. And my philosophy is, is if you're interested, I can teach you everything else. So I always want them to know that, you know, I really want to look for good craftsmanship, attention to detail, um, uh, just the different things that you should look for in somebody that's getting ready to go into that type of field. 
yeah, I see. I can definitely tell a big difference from when they start to the time that they end. And they're also very dedicated students too, because I usually get them a little later in their program. They're usually not freshmen or anything like that. Your craftsmanship shows yourself. If you show poor craftsmanship, it's a lack of valuing, um, you know, what people think of you. And so, like sometimes I'll have students who are kind of messy with their pieces, um, and then as I teach them the better craftsmanship, then they get uh, better and better at it, and they start to feel that more confidence from it. But yeah, a lot of them go on to keep on uh, working with it. Uh, I don't know of anybody who like switched careers for it, but uh, I know that there's several of them that have kept up with it, which is nice to see. And the Goose Pond Wildlife Area near Linton is expanding. The Sycamore Land Trust bought an 85-acre tract that's now part of the recreation area. The reason why this 85-acre property is significant is it's considered a keystone property. So it's at the corner of a whole area that we want to protect around Goose Pond. The tract includes the confluence of two streams that are the wetland-filled Goose Pond site's main water sources. Goose Pond opened in 2005 and draws about 12,000 wildlife watchers each year. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers, now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.